As members were transferred to other prisons, so was La Eme. By 1967, the gang had grown to 50 members throughout the California prison system. Their numbers were low because La Eme only took the toughest inmates, the worst of the worst as carnales. We would have fewer numbers on a prison yard. They would have more numbers and they would be on the defense against us. La Eme recruited one of these quality soldiers in 1968, Joe Morgan, known as Peg Leg Morgan because of his prosthetic leg. Morgan had been convicted of murder at 17 and became the youngest criminal ever to be sent to San Quentin. At 39, he joined the Mexican Mafia. A Yugoslavian raised in an Hispanic community, he crossed racial lines. Even though he was not Hispanic, his experience made him a respected member among his brothers. Morgan helped build what would become La M.A.'s most lucrative racket, selling drugs. He was hugely disciplined, mentally tough, very bright. He knew how to, how to conduct business in the jails and on, and on the street, and he was a terrific earner for them. He, he made a lot of money selling and moving heroin around. Morgan had contacts in the Mexican drug cartels and kept a steady supply of heroin flowing into prison. With Peg Leg Morgan on board, La M.A.'s drug profits soared. In addition to his money making, Morgan brought another critical change to La M.A. Because of his race, he was able to reach out to the most brutal white prison gang in the system. It was a known fact that Morgan was an ally or some kind of an associate of the Aryan Brotherhood. And uh, since that day to this, the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia have had a, uh, a mutual alliance, an alliance of mutual support. If there's ever a war or a fight in the prison system, Aryan Brotherhood will support the Mexican Mafia and vice versa. By the late 1960s, the Mexican Mafia had spread throughout the California prison system. La M.A. had formed an alliance with their only rival for brutality, and they were making serious money selling drugs. Now, they were ready to take over the streets. 1969, the Mexican Mafia, or La M.A., had become a brutal force throughout California's prison system. Their numbers remained small. They recruited only the most vicious inmates to become their brothers, known as Carnales. One of their newest recruits was a 20-year-old veteran of an L.A. street gang, Ramon Mundo Mendoza. Mundo was serving time at Sam Quentin for murdering a gang rival with a machete. And I swung the machete and I nearly uh, severed his head uh, from his body. And I remember seeing him going through his death throes. His body was convulsing and it somewhat bothered me at that time because it was the first person I had ever killed. At San Quentin, word of Mendoza's brazen crime filtered through the prison grapevine. With La M.A. always on the lookout for the toughest inmates, they set their sights on young Mendoza. Not long after he arrived, they started to size him up. Back in those days, before you could join the Mexican Mafia, you had to have unanimous approval from every member in the prison system. If one member said no for any reason, you could not join. After a long period of careful scrutiny, Mundo was voted in. Mendoza knew what he was getting into. Joining the MA represented finality. I remember that I really liked the idea that the only way out was to be killed. I thought that was the ultimate. He quickly learned how the gang operated. In MA-controlled prisons, each cell block is assigned a bloquero. The bloqueros collect taxes and enforce order. He also learned that the Mexican Mafia expected him to play by their rules. As active Mexican Mafia members, we are forever under each other's scrutiny for telltale signs of weakness. If anybody shows weakness, they're put to a test. And if they fail the test, they'll be killed. First rule, as far as the outside world was concerned, the Mexican Mafia didn't exist. They would rather work under the radar. If you're a member of the organization, you can't admit that you're part of it. To do that is a death sentence. 
Conversations about the gang were often carried out with carefully chosen words. They will say, my homeboy just got married to Maria last week. And that means my homeboy has just joined the Mexican mafia. Another rule, Carnales could never cooperate with the prison guards in any way, even if they'd been injured by someone outside the gang. If you were stabbed uh, by an enemy, you couldn't go to the police uh, or the guards and say, I've been stabbed. You're not in the, the system, our system of government. You have your own system, and you would take care of it through your own system. The Mafia Carnales also maintained a public pride in their heritage, using an ancient Aztec language for code, and wrapping their violent acts in tales of history and culture. To throw off guards and other prisoners, La Eme sometimes speak in the ancient Nahuatl language. Death is the punishment for disrespecting La Raza, the Mexican race. The Mexican Mafia likes to use the culture, the Aztec culture, which is a beautiful culture. It's beautiful, but they use it as a propaganda tool. We're not murderers, but we are warriors, and we have a culture, and it, because when we kill you, it's because I'm fighting for that cause. This culture is displayed on the bodies of MA members in the form of tattoos. Images of Aztec calendars, warriors, and eagles show the gang's pride in their race and heritage. From his new M.A. brothers, Mendoza learned practical lessons as well, like the best ways to carry out a murder in prison without getting caught. The most popular way of isolating a target for execution in a, on a prison yard would be to create a diversion on another part of the yard, to start a fist fight, or to have three inmates attack three other inmates in, in a fist fight. Another rule was no cowardice. A trait Mendoza says he never displayed. He claims he never had any problems taking out prisoners who'd crossed the Mafia. I was perpetually a member in good standing because I always was involved in killing people. Uh, during my membership, I was involved in, in, in my hand. I killed uh, approximately a half a dozen individuals while I was in prison. Suspected of several murders in prison, Mendoza spent the last five years of his sentence in lockdown, held in solitary confinement in order to keep him from killing any other inmates. Mundo claims that he was never charged for any of the prison murders because no one on the inside dared to testify against a Mexican Mafia member. Mendoza was paroled in July 1975. The first person he contacted was legendary MA gangster Joe Morgan, also out on parole. When he met with Morgan, he took another M.A. with him, Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez. With the support of their M.A. brothers, they decided Mundo and Sailor Boy would reorganize the drug trade throughout California on behalf of the Mexican Mafia. To do that, they needed the cooperation of their paroled Carnales. What we were going to do is take over all these areas and replace the dealers that were already selling dope or get the dealers that were selling dope to sell our dope. So what Sailor and I did is we laid the foundation. The plan was simple. They had a connection that could provide a steady supply of high quality heroin. They would install their own dealers or force local dealers to sell La Emes dope. Consequences were deadly for those who did not comply with the Mexican Mafia's new business plan to take over the drug trade. It became easier for us to eliminate those who resisted, those who did not want to comply, uh, than to give them a beating. We thought about breaking their legs or giving them a good beating, and then we thought, why waste our time? Let's just kill them and let's replace them. So that's what we did. What they do is the Mexican Mafia approaches them and says, buy your narcotics from us and we'll give you a discount. And uh, if you don't, we'll kill you. <laughs> so the people buy their narcotics from them. Then they come back later and say, how much narcotics did you sell? Oh, well, we get a third of that. They called it spreading the gospel about the Mexican Mafia's drug supply. And it worked. 
Within months, dealers fell in line rather than cross Lyame. This former gang member collected taxes for the Mexican Mafia. It was taxing of neighborhoods, and uh, they had a green light system, you know, where if you didn't comply with uh, what they were asking of you, um, you were going to have to pay money. People were going to have to die. They wanted uh, accountability. They made sure that every gang in Los Angeles, um, they had somebody who was accessible to the Mexican Mafia.